Hello and welcome to a Q30 News exclusive interview with Quinnipiac University President Judy Olian. I'm Brooke Riley. Thank you for joining me, President Olian. I'm happy to be here in front of this cozy fireplace on this almost wintry day. <laughs> we always like to have you. So my first question for you today is, what do you think the job of a modern university president is? Great question. Well, we need to be thinking about the future and what that looks like in terms of both job demands, but also the people needs, the educational needs of the individuals. And I think that it involves two things. First of all, jobs are changing in a way that we almost can't predict. So you need to be thinking about the mindset the critical thinking skills, the system thinking, the capacity to work in multicultural teams, cultural IQ, the skill sets that, individual need, that individuals need. But we also need to be thinking about who the student of the future is. And it isn't just, and I hate to say this to 18 to 22 year olds who are here, it isn't just 18 to 22 year olds. When you think about the workforce of today, we're, we're in a, unprecedented era of dizzying change and we're working for 30, 40, 50 years and yet we were schooled for the next five years maybe. So how do you keep up with the next 45? I was at a meeting yesterday where they were talking about welders who need to be coders because the jobs in manufacturing have become industry 4.0 and very sophisticated. So as the university of the future, which of course is what we talk about at Quinnipiac, we need to be thinking about the skill set, but also the learners and how we meet with their needs. And it isn't just coming to campus. It's learning while you're cooking, learning while you're on the train, learning while you're in the car, learning while you're at work. And so it's the medium of delivery as much as it is the content. Awesome. So what are the university's strategies to fundraising so we can get all of this? Uh, every university is looking to individuals to help run the economics of the university because it cannot be just from the tuition that students pay. First of all, it's too burdensome for students. And secondly, uh, the university needs keep escalating in terms of faculty, in labs, in simulations, in technology, in facilities. So you have to make a very compelling case of need. Our donors have to believe in us that they can trust us with their hard-earned dollars, that we will in fact make a difference, really move the needle towards the future with their hard-earned dollars. So it's the trust, but it's also the ideas of the future that will ignite their interest and their passion. So last May at your inauguration ceremony, you announced that Chairman of the Board of Trustees, William Weldon, donated $15 million to the university. What is that being used for now? A number of things. Uh, I mean, uh, part of it is the Weldon uh, Chair, uh, an Oxford program partnership, which is around rehabilitative medicine. Uh, uh, Mr. Weldon and his wife, Barbara, are also uh, supporting scholarships for students. And they're also supporting Trustee House, which is going to be the new and ongoing house for the president. And of course, as time goes on, their contributions will change to other priorities depending on the needs of the university and what their passions are. And so you mentioned the University of the Future before. I know that's the theme for the five-year strategic plan that you're working on. How has that been going so far? When you develop a strategic plan, you think longer term. You don't think just about the immediacy of what's tomorrow. And with the students' input, faculty input, staff, and stakeholders like the trustees and alumni, we developed the strategic plan around four pillars. The mindset for the 21st century, inclusive excellence, well-being of both our community here and also the communities around us, and lifelong learning. So I can give you some examples of what we've already started or launched in each case. So in the case of the mindset of the University of the Future, we're uh, working on some new uh, programs like environmental sciences, which represents where the puck is headed. We're also talking about and 
executing on having digital courses in every student's experience across Quinnipiac so that every graduate of Quinnipiac is digitally savvy. That's very much 21st century. Inclusive excellence. You probably know that we've uh, tried to expand the diversity and inclusivity of the university by bringing in uh, new and additional students who are uh, more broadly representative of the communities in which we live. So the community college partnerships with Housatonic and Gateway or our uh, Promise Scholarship Program, those are designed to in fact expand the diversity of, of the campus and also having conversations, deep conversations around what equity and inclusion means. On the third pillar, wellness, we've scoped a wellness center, we're tweaking it. It's a very comprehensive wellness center, which will be for physical fitness, for the, mental, for the medical needs of our students, and then also for emotional counseling, all in one comprehensive approach, plus programming for life around wellness. And lastly, lifelong learning, we're partnering with some companies in Connecticut to say, how can we address your ongoing needs for your employees as lifelong learners? So those are just some examples in each case. Thank you. Um, so there's been major budget concerns across the university all, aboard, all around. Um, what are your plans to fix the issues in the future here? We know that we're in a new demographic uh, across the country and especially uh, on the East Coast. Uh, the demographics of the 18-year-olds have been declining over time, and I think the trough will be 2025. And so enrollment pressures have occurred in many, many universities across the country. And, and my answer is that we need to think about what the right size of Quinnipiac University is going towards the future. But the main issue is to be distinctive and excellent at what we do so that students view us as their first choice institution. And we've started on that around these new programs. The strategic plan is really positioning us uh, for the future and for distinctions of the future. Uh, you know that we um, had a goal of uh, getting even stronger students in terms of incoming uh, quality and scores and we achieve that. But as we move forward we'll, with our new VP for Enrollment Management, uh, VP Eric Sykes, we're looking at what, what's the right size of a university like ours, what should the mix be? And then we tailor the budget to that. Okay. And how have students been directly affected by these budget cuts? Well, I'm really proud to say that we haven't taken our foot off the um, uh, 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 off the accelerator in terms of investing in our strategic plan. So I hope you are noticing around campus a variety of improvements. Uh, you already know about club sports and next year's free laundry. We're going to have three major new dorms. Uh, all but the shell is new in Paul Roth, Lassen, and I've forgotten the third. Troop. Troop, right. And uh, we're, this year we'll be uh, really upgrading the public spaces of Rocky Top. Labs have been improved dramatically. So nothing has really changed in terms of our investment in the future. Obviously, with fewer students on campus, you have fewer sections and classes, so you can afford to have slightly fewer faculty teaching in those classes. And then uh, we've asked every one of the schools to look at what they're doing and say, what is not essential for the future of the campus? What is not essential for, to be a university of the future? And in reality, not everything that we did 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, represents the future. So this is a time that we can revisit and reassess what is critical to the future. Awesome. So yesterday you held a town hall with faculty and staff. How did you run that and what were your overall thoughts on how it went? Well, we are interested with both faculty and staff and with students and we're going to have the uh, student town hall meeting uh, very shortly, I think it's December 3rd, mm -hmm. that we want to have an open conversation and we don't go in with any agenda. We open the floor up to any questions that, that come up. 
and with the key members of the senior management team there, I think we can provide the best answers, the most knowledgeable answers uh, to anything that comes up. So my view is lay it all out, open the kimono, and let's have an open discussion and be um, as constructive and productive as we can be. And sometimes uh, some questions come up that you are surprised about. Sometimes it's an honest conversation about difficult issues, but that's exactly what should be happening. And I hope it happens with our students. So you held a student town hall last February, I believe it was. Um, is your plan to run it similar to how that one was? Well, I, I, I'd like to run it um, with the best advice from our students, but I don't have any preset agenda. Nothing is off the table. Uh, we, we are open to addressing any questions that come from the students. I don't necessarily have to have any prepared statements in advance. I'd like to maximize the time for however the students want to use it. And I really welcome the feedback and the candid feedback that comes from students. I want to hear, I want to listen, because some of our best ideas have, have come from these open discussions. Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable, but usually even that discomfort leads to some rethinking and some productive ideas. But I'd, I'd love it to be as open as possible. And speaking of openness, last semester when we met with you, uh, you talked about being more transparent with faculty, staff, and students. How's that been going so far? Well, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, we're a lot more um, transparent about the direction of the institution with the strategic plan. I think that creates clarity. Uh, in addition, I think that there's more decentralization of how decisions are made, uh, strategic decisions, budget, budget decisions, to the schools and major units so that they're much more in control. But in the end, it's going to be in the eye of the beholder. You know that I hold office hours, two or three hour office hours as, as uh, frequently as the schedule permits, and we always follow up on what comes up. And again, I say, I hear, I listen, and I find lots of great ideas from those open conversations. Awesome. And moving to a little bit of a different topic, there's been some tension between the town of Hamden and the university throughout the years, with the most recent issue being over the property at 305 Spruce Bank Road, changing it from residential to university use. What are your thoughts on all of this? Are you guys working to improve the relationship with the, in, the town and the university? I, I think that we have an opportunity here to uh, really establish a partnership. And Vice President Bethany Zemba has been spending a lot of her time on that. And I think the, from the mayor on down, he would say, and, and the city council, that there has been a, a, tr a tremendous outreach from the university. And I think over time, uh, we'll see improvement, and we're already seeing improvement in the relationships. As you know, the town of North Haven has a long-standing, highly productive relationship uh, with the town. Let me give you examples of what's happened uh, with the town of Hamden. First of all, we've established a, a, a community partnership committee with residents of Hamden and faculty and staff here uh, that uh, Vice President Zemba has organized where we have ongoing dialogue about what, what the issues are, what the tensions are, and how we can improve them. Uh, the uh, two Vice Presidents, Zemba and Vice President Monique Drucker of Student Affairs, went around the neighborhoods distributing cookies and also magnets for refrigerators with a hotline number in case there are any issues that come up in the community. The students are doing, uh, the students, faculty and staff are engaged in many, many initiatives and partnerships with the community from being involved in schools to the service day uh, to uh, preparing tax returns. And we don't publicize that enough, so we're creating a website, which is a community website. We have community events on campus. Many of our students, and praise to the students this past Saturday, where we had a boobash, a Halloween celebration, 
for the kids of the neighborhoods, their parents and grandparents, and we had more than 800 people on campus who were engaged in a variety of activities. So this doesn't happen overnight, it's a process, but more and more I think the town is seeing um, outreach and uh, we are certainly keen to partner around the priorities of the township. Awesome. So moving to another different topic. Um, so some students have expressed a little bit of frustration with the counseling services here at Quinnipiac uh, with long lead times and limited availability. What are your thoughts on this? Is health and wellness a priority of the university right now? It's one of our most important priorities and it's of great concern to us the escalating demand for uh, counseling services and we've increased the number of counselors and we continue to increase the number of counselors who are available and of course the wait times are shortened dramatically if there's an urgent case because we triage cases immediately. Um, it, uh, we've seen a spike every year at the beginning of the year uh, for need for those services and certainly uh, long wait times are not acceptable and, and we just have to uh, catch up on, on meeting those needs and we've already hired some more, or created some more hours of counseling since the beginning of the year and this year was much more than last year. Obviously the investment in the wellness center will include a very important priority investment in, in spaces and services for counseling. But I also think that we have to create a, a healthy foundation for life. So part of the wellness center program will be courses or sessions on how do you deal with stress, how do you deal with eating disorders, anxiety, family tensions, financial pressures, sleeping disorders. Uh, and, and so w when you come out of Quinnipiac, you're not just cognitively prepared and career prepared, but you also have a healthy foundation for life and knowing how to cope with the inevitable challenges that occur. Awesome. So do you have any other plans for the university for next semester or the rest of this semester that we didn't already discuss yet? Um, well, we have a, a, a lot of plans on the academic front. Every one of our uh, college, colleges and uh, professional schools and every one of our academic and administrative units is preparing a strategic plan. So you start with the overarching strategic plan and the four pillars and every one of our units is saying, all right, what does it mean in our unit? How can we excel or distinguish ourselves? And so the strategic planning is occurring at the unit level. And on top of that, we're uh, going to be really planning our enrollment outlook for next year with some new data with our new vice president and from that the budget model and how we um, hire and, and grow and build uh, will, will be determined. Great. Well that's all the time that we have for today's interview. Thank you again for joining me President Olian. Brooke, thank you so much and I always enjoy being here. Thank you. Be sure to stay up to date with all of Q30's content at Q30TV.com and follow us on social media at Q30 Set Television. For everyone behind the scenes, I'm Brooke Riley. Good night.